Exaggerator is finishing with conviction this afternoon. Exaggerator, an absolutely brilliant victory in the Santa Anita Derby over more spirit. Bobby Shoemaker, Andrew Calvano, it's Tournament Talk on the Tournament Edge for Friday, April 15th. As always, four races on the docket, but actually, Andrew and I are going to do things a little bit differently tonight on Tournament Talk. Since last Saturday was such an important day in regards to the Kentucky Derby and the Kentucky Derby prep races, he and I are going to break down those three races, talk specifically about the winner, talk about the race as a whole as far as race shape things of that nature, and what we think of the winners going forward. So, Andrew, uh, without further ado, let's start in California at Santa Anita. It was the $1 million grade one Santa Anita Derby. Your winner was Exaggerator. Great pick by you. You were all over this horse. He won like a good thing. He got a 103 buyer speed figure, highest figure of any horse run thus far on the Kentucky Derby Trail. Your thoughts on Exaggerator's performance, your thoughts on this horse moving forward into the Kentucky Derby. I thought the performance itself was just, just lights out. And, you know, when you saw him turn it for home, you knew he had so much horse and he, he blew away, you know, at the top of the stretch like the other horses were twenty five thousand dollar claimers. I had, you know, just, just lights out. I think the wet track definitely benefited him. And that's what's gonna hesitate me from taking him come Kentucky Derby time. A horse to be respected as the class, but I really think that muddy track is what put him over the edge. And that's what we talked about on last week's tournament talk, going into the race. Should it be muddy, he's going to be the one that benefits the most. You can't knock him on the 103 buyer. You can't knock him on a performance like that. But I'd be weary taking him in the first, uh, first Saturday in May, you know, just based on he hasn't performed well on a, on a fast track yet, you know. I agree, Andrew, and I'm surprised to hear you say that. I thought you'd defend him a little bit more, but... Uh... You're certainly being objective here, and I want nothing to do with this horse yeah. moving forward. I mean, if if it's a muddy track, obviously he moves yeah, to the top. Uh, but I'm handicapping this race right now based on being a fast track, and this horse is not going to be in any type of ticket that I have, whether it's pick four, tournaments, uh, superfectas, which you can make a lot of money on superfectas in the Kentucky Derby. I just don't think the horse is very good. I don't think it's a coincidence that it's two best races, have been run over a sloppy racetrack. The, the jackpot, as you mentioned last week, and then this this past week's performance was certainly over the top and way over exceeding his expectations. Um, I'm going to be nice here when I say this about Mike Smith. That ride on Danzig Candy was perplexing, to say the least. Um, when you take a horse going that far against the caliber of horses he was facing and go that fast, 45 and change, I don't even know if American Pharaoh could do that. Um, yeah. He set this horse up for disaster, and that's exactly what happened. Um, and I think the race played exactly to Exaggerator's strength as far as conditions. And um, I don't think More Spirit's that good. I've never been a fan of More Spirit. I've always thought Exaggerator had more upside than More Spirit, for whatever that's worth. He beat an overrated horse, and then he beat a horse that just got a horrendous ride. And uh, I still say that Danzig Candy is the best three-year-old on the West Coast. My opinion does not change there. I think with a proper ride, if they go to the Kentucky Derby, this horse is a major player, Andrew. So I'm drawing a line through the Santa Anita Derby. My opinion doesn't change at all, except I think uh, the connections of Danzig Candy should probably look for a new jockey, even though they won't. Yeah, you know, i got to agree with you. The ride was, like you said, very confusing to say the least. You know, the horse could have been so much more of a factor. And, you know, as we talk more about, you know, Exaggerator, you know, Danzig Candy's, the, you know, the race he ran really, you know, as well as the muddy track benefited the Exaggerator. You know, so I'm glad to see we're on the same page going forward with Exaggerator. But, you know, Danzig Candy's a horse you have to respect going forward. The Southern California crop of three-year-olds have been major players in the Kentucky Derby in the last few years. And Danzig Candy is going to be the one, obviously, out of the West Coast. 
More sphere, like I said, I'm not sold on the horse e either. He's beating some short fields, you know, horses that are just question marks. You know, maybe he beat one good horse out of those races, but like you said, Bobby, Dan's a candy still has to be respected. And throwing a line through him is just what I'm doing as well. Grade one bluegrass. Um, you and I really didn't like this race a lot. We both were in agreement that of the three races um, last Saturday, this was by far the weakest, although it had 14 horses. Um, we both were on Zulu. I, I felt like it was a tepid selection by you. It certainly was a tepid selection by me. And I even regretted the pick the day after the show. Uh, once reading the form again, I know you always get a different perspective when you read racing forms a lot, which is why I try to read it once or twice and move on. But right. this was obviously a susceptible horse. And the formulator fact uh, that was brought up that Todd Pletcher is now one for 18 in graded stakes races in which he puts the blinkers on a horse for the first time. The horse just isn't that good. In fact, the race just wasn't that good. Um, I thought your winner, um, very susceptible. The race came back slow. So much like all the horses except Danza Candy in the Santa Anita Derby, I don't think any horse in the bluegrass is a player moving forward. It was a very weak race. I thought that before, before the race went off. I think it proved that even more uh, after the race was over. The horse took advantage. Your winner took advantage of a great ride by Luis Saez. I guess I was a little bit wrong in reference to my man, Sam. Uh, he was better than what I thought. But that effort is still not good enough to no. go a mile and a quarter and beat other horses that you and I have talked about and will talk about. So your thoughts on Brody's calls, your thoughts on how the bluegrass played out. I thought Brody's calls ran a good race, you know, with the factors that half the field wasn't exciting at all. I mean, you could put a line through half the horses going into that field. Zulu not showing up. You know, Bob, we talked about in Tournament Talk last week about, you know, the blinkers, the blinker situation. We weren't too sure of it, but we just wanted to move on and just think, you know what, maybe Pletcher can get us through this race with not much else in it. Not a race I want to have anything out of going into the Kentucky Derby. Bob, I'm, I don't want to, I'm not sure of the actual statistic, but I'm going to guess and say from what I remember was there hasn't been a bluegrass winner in, I want to say, 30 years. It's been a long know? time. And, and I don't think that's going to change anything this year. One point I want to make, however, coming out of this race is Loudon. You know, for the horse he is, still a maiden. I thought this horse is still running very well against tougher competition. I would, you know, if this horse takes any sort of class shot, maybe even to another grade three or, you know, uh, um, you know, $100,000 non-restricted stakes, whatever it may be, you know, that's a horse I'm going to look to. So I really like the upside on that horse. And whether he goes back to California for the Del Mar summer, the Saratoga summer, that's going to be a horse to look to at a price. Yeah, Labon was, was very game in defeat. I mean, he was leading that race, I believe, till the 16th pole, and I thought he would get a better ride than he got last time, and they went 45 and change. I mean, you're just not going to be able to go that far, that fast, that long, unless you got a super horse. And let's face it, we not only don't have a super horse in this three-year-old class, we've got a majority of below-average three-year-olds. I mean, this Kentucky yeah. Derby is... Not going to be anything to write home about, in my opinion. And I heard someone say a couple of days ago, Andrew, and I quite frankly agree with him, that a 99 buyer speed figure may be good enough to win the Kentucky Derby. Now, again, I don't like that figure maybe as much as you and others, but everybody sets that number as the precedence. And we all know that at 99, wouldn't even have won most of these prep races last year with these horses that we had. No. So uh, this is just a very mediocre crop, and I – I think Laubaum, with a better ride on Saturday, could have been a, a major player as far as being in the money and possibly possibly winning the race. I, yeah. Zulu's out. Um, I think uh, he proved his worth, which is not much against yeah. a subpar group to begin with. If you want Brody's cause, you can have him. I, I'm not going to say I'm not going to put him in super effective because – I don't want him to beat me for 20, 30, 40 grand, which let's face it, we've seen supers pay that much in this yep. race before. But he's just too slow. I mean, everything's going to have to go his way. The whole pace is going to have to fall apart, Andrew. And then he's going to have to get a great ride by Luis. Not to say he's not capable, but I'm saying everything is going to have to work out for this horse because he's just not fast enough. Yeah. No, I, I agree with you. And no knock on Luis Saez, but 
There's a difference than, you know, riding the whole Goshen meet and riding the 24-horse Kentucky Derby, which Louis Sias doesn't have much experience in. You know, so that that point is, is very acceptable. And, and and with you know, with Brody's Claws out of there, yeah, like I, like Bobby, like you said, you know, take him if you want him. You know, he'll be a price, sure. But I mean, oh, nobody's ever come out of the bluegrass that's exciting enough to win a Kentucky Derby. It hasn't been done in X amount of years. And like you said, race, Bobby, the race is just slow. slow. I mean, the, the race had three maidens. You know, five other horses that could have been eligible for cheaper allowance fields. I, I mean, the field to begin with just wasn't strong at all. It wasn't. So we're going to move on to what I felt like had the most potential to be a blockbuster, and it certainly was. Yeah, sure it was. It wasn't the way I thought it would play out necessarily, but we're going to move on to the Wood Memorial at Aqueduct. Unfortunately, this race was marred just like the Santa Anita Derby by terrible conditions. Outwork your winner, your second winner on Tournament Talk. Congratulations for a good week last week. I got on this one with you, so uh, uh, we were right. I thought the impress the the performance by Outwork was impressive. Um, I hear the knock all week. Well, they came home extraordinarily slow. It was the fastest Wood Memorial in the history of the race. All that is true, but aren't they taking into account the conditions of the racetrack and how sloppy it was? Are they taking into account how wide Outwork was in the first turn? how wide he was in the second turn, how fast they went the first uh, two quarters of this race. For this horse, for it being only a second time going two turns, for the first time he faced temperatures this low, and that counts. I mean, this horse had been in Florida. This horse had been running in better weather, weather, and certainly had never faced the track conditions like this. To overcome all those obstacles, to still win that race, I don't care if he beat an 80 to one shot by head. This, I didn't give this horse a chance to win after I looked and saw 46 and change. I said, no way is he going to win. He won the race. He was game in defeat. I mean, in, in victory, excuse me, and wouldn't let a horse pass him. I think this horse is a super bright future. Quickly, before you give me your thoughts, I did a comparison of Todd Pletcher's horses from a three-year-old perspective this time of year uh, to other horses, such as Verrazano, who was – Highly touted, who people said this is the best three year old the Todd Pletcher's ha- ever had. Andrew Outwork's numbers hammer Verrazano's numbers at this time of year in comparison to where Verrazano was at this time of year. This is a special horse. Now, I'm not saying he's going to win the Kentucky Derby, I think he's a player, but I'm saying this horse going to Saratoga, this horse going to Belmont, he's going to win a lot of races. This horse is a player in the Derby and certainly got a bright future. Your thoughts on Outwork and the Wood Memorial as a whole? You know, I thought the victory was just so game. And that horse on the inside rail, Trojan Nation, was could have been your eventual winner. He was a very game horse on the rail, but Outwork fought him off. And when you see that with three-year-olds, you know, you see the physicality and the toughness they have of, you know, putting away an eager horse on the inside of them, you know, that just makes you a little more excited for a horse going uh, further. Like you said, I think he is out of, Todd Fletcher's Kentucky Deer hopefuls between Destin and, and Outwork. I think Outwork is by far yeah. uh, the horse who has the higher ceiling, especially going into Saratoga. You know, we talked about Todd Fletcher making this move when he comes up from Goshen to Aqueduct, um, you know, from different kind of states, you know, whatever it may be. He, he excels. Michael Poli owns it. Michael Poli is a St. John's guy. That's kind of why I was on him as well. But all I know is my school is going to be representing the Kentucky Derby. That's pretty cool. But right. You know, Outwork is, is just a very game horse, and I would not leave him off any ticket in the Kentucky Derby. I think his front-end style is definitely one that you want to have going into the Kentucky Derby. You never really want a horse that's saying, oh, well, this, yeah, this horse can come off for, you know, off 24 lengths, you know, because he does this, whatever. I like my horses a little bit closer to the front end coming uh, with those big fields. So, should he get a good draw? Could be my horse. You know, uh, haven't, obviously haven't seen anything yet with the field or the post positions, anything like that, but Outwork's going to be a very, very tough horse come first Saturday night. He's going to be a tough horse. And, again, I'm not picking him either. I'm just telling you that out of all these prep races that we've been covering since you joined Tournament Talk, you know, this is one of the the, the best horses that we've talked about. And I like the versatility from the horse. And something else that I saw, he was waiting on Johnny B to tell him what to do. Yeah. He was loping along that first quarter of a mile at a very rapid pace, and you could tell – he was, he, he, he was asking Johnny V, what do you want me to do? When Johnny V asked him to go to the lead, he went to the lead. 
albeit being wide. That's the thing that I think he may have a little bit more upside than Danzig Candy. Not that I wouldn't bet Danzig Candy. I haven't made my mind up yet. Danzig Candy has gone to lead and run as fast as he can for as far as he can thus far. Maybe that's the ride. Maybe that's his style. But what I saw of Outwork just looks like he can do either. Either go to the lead or maybe sit just off of it. And you need versatility on the first Saturday of May. I think this horse is going to be very, very good for Todd Pletcher. And I think this is one of the best horses that he's had at this juncture of any three-year-olds he's had in a long time. I really believe that. Without a doubt. And, you know, I thought, obviously, the, how the race played out was a little different than you and I broke it down last Thursday. I thought Matt King Cole was just, you know, going to you know, be the horse he was even battling with coming the stretch. But I thought Matt King Cole, whether it was a sloppy track or maybe because he set – you know, some crazy fractions there, but, um, and he you know, quit. Out yeah, it. yeah, exactly. You know, that's the crazy thing, you know, so like, like we said, you know, outwork Woody overcame, uh, the, the fractions. I remember cause I was watching the race. I was actually at Aqueduct and I was watching it from with Dan Torchman from America's Best Racing. And I said to him, I said, this horse can't be serious with a 22 quarter. Yeah. And then, the, then the half mile, the half mile goes up. I said, this horse still can't be serious. Right. And then when he won, I mean, that was just amazing. You know, I, you know what I mean? Really so awesome. to overcome all that, definitely horse to be respected. Yeah, and, and much more to, to, to build on. I mean, he's we haven't seen the best, I don't believe, of our no. So, okay, let's move on and find some winners for the viewers tonight, Andrew. We'll, we'll start at Aqueduct. Um, it is race eight on the card. It's a $65,000 allowance optional claimer. Seven furlongs on the dirt for three-year-olds. It's a field of nine, Andrew. The seven horse beyond the green is your three to one morning line favorite. Do you find this horse being the legitimate favorite, or do you think he's susceptible? Uh, the horse is every right to be the favorite. Um, you know, just a just very game horse. Uh, in the money six times out of seven on a, on a, on a fast start, I'm sorry. Races well at Aqueduct. Comes out of a competitive race last time out and cuts back. But I looked at a horse that's also coming out of his last race. That's number four, more Zen T. Cuts back to seven furlongs for the Englehart Barn, who clicks a uh, 30% wrap to sprint here. Those very competitive buyer numbers that arguably are the most consistent in this group. 10 for 43 lifetime, but if we narrow it down to dirt starts, 8 for 21, hitting the board 19 times, only missing a two. That's just incredible no matter what company you're running at. You know, I've seen this type of race before at Aqueduct when we, when we talk about tournaments. You know, the horse is going to be a good price, and the horse has history of hitting the board. So, hits the board at a good price, sure. The favor wins, okay, whatever. You still get a good price or place to show whatever it may be. But this horse also has the ability to win. You know, last time out, he looked like a winner with a furlong to go, gets run down by a good horse in Jaeger. You know, I'm really thinking we can get higher odds on sorts. I'm really thinking we can get 8-1, to one, maybe even 10-1 to one horse, and I'll tell you why, Bob. The two uncharted courses could be a lone speed. He's going to take some more money. Vincento, number six, for Rudy Rod, making... Uh, a class drop from the Gotham down to here. He's going to take some money. Jose Ortiz, who's at 6-1, is just going to take some money because he's Jose Ortiz. And the number 7, like we talked about, is also going to take some money. If that increases my price on more Zen T here, I can get 8-1, to 10-1. to one. This is my horse all the way across the tournaments. So as far as a pace perspective playing out, I heard you mention the two-horse uncharted course you felt like was going to be the speed. Do you see anything else uh, going out there with the two early in the race? You know... When I said low in speed, I, I thought he was just the quickest in this group. And I didn't really expect much to come after him, although, obviously, he will have some competitors. To be honest, out of the entry of Street Lord, that's the one that could curious how it's the one. And Street Lord can go out of him, but for a better trip, he's going to need the rate. And Curious Cow really hasn't shown speed like in earlier starts. So I'm just kind of hoping the speed's not there for them. Besides True Bet, maybe, there's nobody else. I mean, number eight, all about actually... Showed some major speed in earlier career, but hasn't been in that form since. So I think this two gets loose on the front end of Manny Franco. I read it differently from a pace perspective, Andrew, which actually led me to the winner of the race based on the pace that I read it to be. Um, I think the two is certainly a fast horse, but I think the five, and you mentioned it, True Bet is the other horse that's going to go out to the lead with the two. And I read this being a very slow pace, unless the two and the five get into some kind of suicide yeah. pace early. But they could go out there and set soft fractions and make this a two-horse race turning for home. A lot of horses are in this race off long layoffs who have been running in longer races. 
Other horses are second, third, fourth off the layoff when they're cutting back in distance. I'm thinking a lot of these horses are using this race for something bigger and for something longer. And I know the two and the five love this distance, and or, or they have been running competitively at five and a half, six furlongs. Mm -hmm. So why not go seven? I think that they're going to be the lone speed. If they don't kill each other, I think it's going to be a two-horse race between the two and the five. And I thought the two and the five were similar as far yeah. as numbers are concerned, as far as figures is concerned. Yeah. And one horse is five to two, and the other is eight to one. And I could make an argument to you that True Bet's race, let me pull up the PP quickly here, the race on February 12th on the inner, I could argue that that race is the best race run by any horse going short in this field. Yeah. I think he could be the speed of the speed. Am I a fan of Cornelio Velasquez? Not really. But there's not much difference between Velasquez and Manny Franco, in my opinion, considering I think it's going to be between the two and the five. I'm getting $18 on a horse that I think has got a legitimate chance to win this race. I think it's True Bet, and uh, I think it's six or seven to one on True Bet, the five horse. I think he's your winner. Yeah, without that, Bob, and you know the notes I wrote down here for number five, True Bet, last time out, very rough start. Clips heels almost yeah, fall down. Scratch that. Oh, throw that race out. You have a very competitive horse. A third, a second. And then last time out, second was December 31st, New Year's Eve. Ran behind a very game go Mets, who has always been, always been very tough on the on New York circuit. You know, the five is definitely, definitely going to be a player. Listen, as my third pick in here, actually. My second pick, and Bob wanted to ask about this horse, number six in Cento. The horse scares me a little bit. It's Rudy Rodriguez dropping down. He goes route to sprint for the first time on his horse. You know, had some questionable jockeys after Irad wasn't available. Gabriel Sias and board his horse dropped from the Gotham and the Gander. But going back to his two optional claiming races, horse is running very, very game at odds on. I think this horse has quite a bit of talent for this level of competition at this racetrack. If they were going a mile, if they were going a mile on the 16th, this might even be my pick considering it's Rudy Rodriguez, and we all know he does wonders in New York. So, uh, But I just think he's just going to be up against it from a pace perspective. I think he's going to be too far out of it. And again, it's nothing to do with the talent in this race. I think this is a very salty $65,000 allowance. I just think a lot of the horses in this race are up against it from a pace perspective. And most of the time, I don't bet races and pick horses solely based on pace. But I think the two and the five are just going to go out there, as I mentioned, and set a very slow pace for this level, and it's going to be a two-horse race turning for home. Um, I think your horse, Moore's NT, is very talented. I think going long, it's between probably the four and the six, but the fact of the matter is we're not going long. We're going seven furlongs, yep. and I just think I'll, I'll give the edge to True Bet at eight to one. So, Andrew, you're on the four, Moore's NT at six to one. I'm on the five, True Bet at eight to one. So let's move on to Kentucky. Um, it is Keeneland Race 7. It's a very salty grade 3 Ben Ali Stakes. It's a mile and an eighth on the dirt for four-year-olds and up. It's a field of 10. And Eagle, the 6, is your 3-1 to one morning line favorite. Andrew, before you go on, I just want to say about this horse, Eagle, we talk about vulnerable favorites a lot. We try to beat vulnerable favorites. I just don't think this horse likes to win. Yeah, and I'm with you, Bob. And the point I wanted to make before getting into my horse, Noble Bird, Eagle, Neck and Neck, General Erod, you know, they all sit around, you know, nobody's higher than 92. All, all respectable horses, but in this field, I just, I have to beat them. You know, I think the Leopard switched from Neck and Neck, and Ian Wilkes farm that he, you know, heated up for in uh, Gulfstream. The switch to Noble Bird, I find that pretty interesting, although he's going to Mark Cassie. But, like I said, i, I got to get a price here. You know, I, I don't think Eagle likes to win, like you said. I think General A-Rod may just be a horse for Florida, you know, kind of similar to what a lot of top Fletcher horses are. Some leave Florida. They just can't race the same. So, with that being said, I, I looked at number two. Are you kidding me? A multiple grade two winner over turf and synthetic will have to try the dirt for the second time out. First start in the dirt with the 2013 uh, Florida Derby. You know, has the ability to rate, and there should be some decent speed signed up, which is going to be important. I won't have to worry about going wide in the first turn as it has to tuck into that two-post pocket. 
Both some of the most competitive buyers. The last time that was November 8th in the autumn, great two. Woodbine, a 102 buyer came back. Has to overcome the layoff, and I understand that's going to be difficult. Roger Adfield does click at 14% off the layoff. Last time the source comes in off the layoff, he gets nosed out. Sure, he's going to have to do it again. He's going to have to run a big, big race here. But he's fired a couple bullet workouts before coming here. And, and you know, Bob, I'm just looking for a price. I think if everything can click with the source, especially with the surface switch, uh, definitely going to be a horse who's going to be there early, and he's going to be there late. What do you think, Bob? Wise guy horse. Have heard yeah. about this horse all week specifically the workouts and now that you mentioned this horse um, i'm looking further into the workouts i mean you cannot deny five furlongs in 59 five furlongs in one minute flat and he worked that last work was at keeneland uh was very solid um, i'm not high on synth horses going to the dirt we talked about this with the spiral a couple of weeks ago numbers tend to translate much better synth yeah. the turf turf descent. I'm not a fan of James Graham, um, and I just steered clear of this horse because of the connections and because of the layoff. But as I mentioned, I've heard about this horse for two days, and now you're bringing him up. So I'll have to go back and look and see if this horse is really going to be a horse I want to include on my pick fours. Uh, I thought this was a very talented race. I thought yeah. that there were, out of the 10 horses, I mean, General A-Rod does have some class. He has won some races in the past that he can hang his hat on. I thought Neck and Neck was a horse that run very fast for a lot of the races. We mentioned Eagle, although he hadn't won since December 19th. Uh, the horse has run in classy races, has been competitive. But I am more confident in this pick than any other pick on the show. Unfortunately, you're not going to get that big a price. But I think Noble Bird is all but a lock in this race. A lot of people are down on him because of that race February 21st, but let's face it here. It was 197 days off the layoff. Mm -hmm. This horse was in that race for a prep, in my opinion. You get Julian Leperu, you get Mark Cassie. This horse runs anywhere uh, close to where he ran, ran on June 13th or May 1st. June 13th referencing the Foster, in which he beat Lee, which I'm a huge fan of. Uh, and, he, and he lost to Prontico by a head on May 1st, and people – May not remember Prontico in on May in May of last year was one of the better older horses in the U.S. He was in prime form. Those two races, Andrew, walk over this field. Uh, not to mention he was in the Whitney against Honor Code and Williams Map. I understand he got beat by 24 and a quarter lengths, but let's face it, there are a yeah. lot of horses in America that are going to be beat by that much by Williams Map and Honor Code. Yep. Uh, he is classy. He is talented. He's got the connections. He's going to be forwardly placed. Look. I mean, I'll be shocked if he doesn't win this race. That's how much I like this horse, and he's 7-2. to two. I'll tell you this. I like him so much. If he goes off at 7-2, to two, which he won't, but if he were, I'd bet him to win. Yeah, Bob, and, and Noble Bird, definitely my second pick, like you said. I, I just didn't know if he could, you know, run back to that Whitney. I'm sorry, that Stephen F. Foster race you mentioned, but definitely a horse to be respected off of back class alone. Julian Leperus has, has been starting off a little bit slow here at Keeneland, but... To be honest, I'd rather have Julian Leperu over Shaw and Bridgman, you know, any day of the week. That's just me. Absolutely. You know, we go back, we look at that Whitney, Honor Code, Liam's Matt, Toneless. It doesn't matter who you are. Those horses are the best in the country. Those horses are taking home Eclipse Awards. They're taking one big grade one races. You're going to lose those horses no matter who you are, most likely. The horse I wanted to bring to your attention, Bob, I wanted to ask how you felt, is number 10, J.S. Bach, Todd Fletcher, Javier Castellano. A 91 buyer off the layoff last time out at Goshen Park. We know those numbers can be a little a little wacky sometimes. Right. But I wanted to ask you this. Do you think Javier Castellano is on the better Todd Fletcher horse or the horse that Fletcher thinks has you know a better chance of winning? You know, And he keeps Luis Saez on General A-Rod, who, in my eyes, I kind of see Luis Saez as a front-end jockey. Why not put him on this 10-horse J.S. Bach? Why is Castellano... Who used to ride General A-Rod on this horse? Your thoughts on that one, Bob? Uh, great question, and I think it's because he knows the ceiling on General A-Rod has been maxed, yep. and that ceiling is not good enough to win races like this, most likely. And here he's got a horse second off the layoff that probably surprised him, running a 115 time form U.S. speed figure off the layoff. Now, look, there have been races 
in the past, not recently, but other races, low-level allowance stakes races that we've covered that horses that we pick don't even run a 115 time form U.S. speed figure. Right. They're running 108s, 109s. This horse runs a 115, and now Todd's got him in a stakes race. And this is not some small barn looking to finish third here. This is yeah. Todd Pletcher who wants to win and thinks he can win in every single race he gets in. I think the horse is intriguing, but as good as this horse was last time out, his numbers still don't remotely come close to Noble Bird's efforts that I already mentioned, which I know it all go, goes back to my pick here, but I'm just saying, although I think the 10 is a good horse, I just can't pick him in this spot because, again, to me, Andrew, Noble Bird is an absolute standout unless he's hurt and he's a shadow of himself because I'm willing to bet you second off the layoff with that back class, he is going to be a monster to beat down the line. Without a doubt, I thought J.S. Spock was interesting. Should he want to go straight to the lead? I know in previous races, you know, he kind of sits there you know, and, and lets the front end do it. Slow races, actually, in fact, in his last two races, was off the layoff. However, you know, I could see him going straight out to the lead this time around just because there may not be much else. What do you think from a pace perspective, Bob? Uh, Ten horses going to the lead. And, and, and again, uh, yeah, he is he's, he very easily – could finish second in this race. Yeah. Uh, I think yeah. that's where he is. I wanted to ask you about the other Pletcher horse before we move on, and it, and it is General A-Rod. I think the, the, the race that he's had success at was over a sloppy racetrack. We don't need to get back into horses, you know, running a huge race in a, on the slot, and they haven't been able to repeat that on the fast service. If he gets a fast track on Saturday, which he will at Keeneland, and he runs poorly again, is this the last race for General A-Rod? Is this all we're going to see from this horse? Because I think we're in agreement that we're not giving this horse a chance to win this race. I, I, would, I would hope so, Bob. I mean, like, like you said before, it was a great point. The ceiling has been maxed on this horse. You know, he ran great running to the Kentucky Derby. You know, tried out the Preakness, tried out Belmont, did the whole Triple Crown thing. I mean, he, he's, a, he's a fun horse, I, I guess you could say. I mean, he's... He has talent, but just, just Bob, he's not in top form anymore. And, you know, that sloppy race on January 28th, when I look at horses that have been declining in form and then they freak over a sloppy track, I don't, I don't care about it. I, I toss it right out. I don't even worry about it. You know, then he, he ships out to the San Diego Handicap. Um, top bunch of rarely ships there, first of all. You know, gets crushed by 17 lengths. Uh, Bob, I just think this horse is just out of form and, you know, if he gets bet, he gets bet. It's, you know, knocks prices up on our odds. You know, but I, I, this could be the very well could be the last race out of this horse. I think it's unfortunate because I thought he was going to be better than yeah. what he was. Not saying triple crown, but I thought he'd win some some races at Saratoga, and he it just it never came to fruition. So, um, Andrew taking a shot with a two horse. Are you kidding me? At eight to one. I'm being boring and going with five horse Noble Bird at seven to two, which is my strongest play of the tournament talk show. So now we're going to move on to Keeneland Race Nine. It's a small Kentucky Derby prep, ten points to the winner. It's the Grade Three Lexington Stakes. It's a mile and a sixteenth on the dirt for three year olds. It's a field of ten. Swipe, a horse I'm a big fan of, uh, just because he continues to run second to Nyquist. It, it, the four horse, he's your nine to five morning line favorite. Do you feel like Swipe is vulnerable here, Andrew? And if you found a horse that you think can beat him, you know, Swipe's one hundred percent the horse to be. And you know, honestly, he could he could crush this group. You know, um, the layoff is going to scare some people. I don't I don't really see it being that big of a deal. This horse runs anything for recent races when he runs behind Nyquist. He can he can crush this group. You know, he would have four more wins if it wasn't for Nyquist, who, hey, we're going to Kentucky, he's, he's number one right now. You know, juvenile winner, all that. Definitely be respected. Uh, as a horizontal player, I don't really want to necessarily single, just because I know I can single the next race with Teppan. So I'm going to try to find a little bit of a price here. Bob, I went to a horse that you and I spoke about a couple weeks ago. That's a number eight, Riker. I, I want to give him another chance. I thought he was, he was hurried out in that Tampa Bay Derby. I thought he just lost some quick energy. Ran into a, what was a, a decently fast pace. The horses wanted no part of that after he got some dirt kicked on him. Second off the layup from Mark Cassie. You know, we look at that Tampa Bay Derby. Destin, Outwork, the Bluegrass winner, Brody's Cause. 
you know, what does that Tampa Bay Derby mean? Not, I know a lot of people are talking about that's going to be a major race going into the Kentucky Derby. So maybe this horse has something out of it as well. Florin Jalou back aboard. And I only saw this, I only saw him as one of the two speed horses in this race. I don't know what you saw, Bob. I only saw him as one of the two main speed horses. Um, if he gets out there, he's, he's definitely a major player. I think that's the horse that can most likely upset Swipe. You know, number five, Synchrony, off the pace, but of course, um, and Collective is to be respected as well. Um, I think Collective is the horse to beat, actually. Um, I watched that last effort on video today, albeit it was at Sunland Park. I get all that. And I know the numbers don't translate, but they were very high. And it was visually very impressive. And it's very intriguing here that Javier Castellano is on a Bob Baffert horse. Yeah, I noticed that too. When those two guys get together, which is very rare, they mean business, just like Javier with Todd Pletcher. So I think this is the horse to beat. I think this horse is in form, um, and I think Swipe is going to need a race. And quite frankly, as big of a fan as I am of Swipe, his races just weren't that fast. But again, that falls in line with most of these three-year-olds. Their races just aren't fast. But I think Swipe's going to need a race. And I just think he's, I think he's up against it. Um, I think the 10 is absolutely the horse to beat. And I went with Riker. I went with our horse. And it for yeah. exactly what you just said. I've liked this horse ever since he got on dirt. I bet him on Breeders' Cup Saturday. Uh, in the tournament, I thought he held a pace advantage. I thought he run very well. Others disagree. I heard people say they didn't think he was visually impressive in the juvenile. He only got beat by four lengths to Nyquist yeah. and Swipe that day and Brody's calls, and it was the first time he'd ever been on dirt, and he did all the heavy lifting early. So, um, I, And then the Tampa Bay Derby, you could, quite argue, you could argue that this horse just needed a race off of 133 days. And I've also heard people say that the Tampa Bay surface – is very quirky. A lot of horses go there, don't run well, go somewhere else and explode. So I'm giving this horse another chance, one more chance. If he doesn't run well on Saturday, he needs to go back to Woodbine and run on the scent, and and we need to move on. But I think this horse will set a good trip, as you mentioned. Um, And I think if he's ever going to win, he's going to take advantage of maybe the 10's numbers look better than what they really are because he's running at Sunland and not facing anything, and Swipe's coming off that long layoff, and Looks like from his workouts, he's being really kind of rushed, trying to get him ready to win this race in case they can sneak into the Kentucky Derby. I'm going to swipe because I think he's in form and he's the best of the horses in form. And you look at these other horses, synchrony, direct message, you know, the, the three horse, I can't pronounce his name. Just, they just don't look that good on form. I don't think this race is that strong. I just think swipe is the, is the now horse considering the layoff. And his class, I think. Excuse me, Riker. Excuse me, is yeah. the horse is the horse to be here? I think uh, for us, uh, as far as value is concerned, uh, of course. And you know, with collected and swipe, do you think you get anything above six to one, or do you think that these three horses are going to be pretty close together with nothing more else in the field? I actually think that people are down on our horse from listening to other people talk that I respect in this business that don't give Riker a shot. Um, I, I think Riker is going to go off above 6-1. to one. I think Swipe is going to be bet, and understandably so. And we know Collect is going to get bet. I mean, he's winning races. And he's got Javier Castellano aboard, and Bob Baffert's training him. We're going to get a good price on this horse. Now, yep. whether he's going to be worth it, that's yet to be determined. And I'm not going to bet this horse at the window. But I'm going to play him in my tournaments and say, finally, you know, repay me for all the times I've picked you and you've come up short. Exactly, and, and you know, very much looking forward to the race. Uh, and I, I honestly think this is going to be a nice price for us, Bob. You know, collected. I just, you know, I just don't know how much I take out of that Sunland race. The, the horse is in form. If he comes back and wins this race, you know what? He beat me. That's fine. I'm including. I'm including the horizontals 100. percent But I just don't want him on top coming out of Sunland. I, I just, I don't know how to play that. You know, I like Riker. Bob, you and I were on him before. Let's take another chance with him after coming out of a race that's produced now the Wood Memorial winner and the Bluegrass winner. And let's, let's get the price here. Andrew and I both are on Riker and admitting that Collected and Swipe are the main contenders. So let's move on to last and certainly not least. It's race 11 at Oaklawn. It's the grade one Arkansas Derby. It's a mile and an eighth on the dirt. 
a $1 million purse, Andrew, a field of 12, and no surprise here, Bob Baffert on a morning line favorite at Oaklawn. Cupid the 10 horse is 2-1 to one and much the horse to be. Yeah, Bob, and a um, couple weeks back in the Rebel, I uh, took this horse at 7-2, went off near 5-2. He won very nicely. I thought that was a very, very game effort. And, Bob, I'll be honest with you, I'll be glad to take him at 2-1 to one again. The horse is undefeated going two turns. Bob Baffert won this race, race last year with American Pharaoh coming off the Rebel win, just like this horse here, not comparing the two, but similar pass he takes to get to the Kentucky Derby. Last half put out some eye-popping fractions, 22-4, and 46-4, finishing in 143. But he showed a different gear when challenged in the stretch. He showed it was a different horse. And if he brings that same mentality, you know, once again, could be a winner. I realistically don't see a different pace setting than in the Rebel, and that's going to be 100% to his advantage. He's going to have some company, but I don't think anything too extreme. You know, and Bob, I... You know, 95 buyer coming out of the Rebel. I don't, I don't think there's many other horses that could do too much at a price. There's obviously a couple of the horses to be respected, but, you know, I, I, can, I only see maybe half the field, you know, uh, potentially beating this horse. And that's just the way I bought. How'd you see it, Bob? Much the horse to beat. I really went into this race so open-minded, doing everything I could mentally to beat this horse. And I couldn't. Uh, I mean, if you look at that Rebel... I mean, he's green and still winning this race by one and a quarter lengths, not even knowing how to switch leads properly and yeah. still winning and holding off a, a decent horse in Whitmore who looked like he was going to pass him at the 16th pole. And that was his only his second attempt going two turns. And the first time he bobbled at the start, so you really didn't know what you were getting out of him. Now you get you know, Bob Baffert, Martin Garcia. We're here at Oakland again with a horse that's going to be forwardly placed at Talk about ceiling, right? I mean, I don't even think we imagine can imagine what the ceiling is on this horse. This horse could be very, very good short-term and long-term. If he improves off the effort, like most of these good horses that we've talked about through the last few weeks have improved, then he is a major player in the Kentucky Derby. And if I think he's a major player in the Kentucky Derby, how can I not pick him here? And I didn't want to, but... Uh, he is the horse to beat, and he's going to win this race. I mean, I think there's some nice horses in here, Andrew. Uh, yeah. Gettysburg yeah. is a nice horse. He's a solid horse. I think he could be successful this summer on the New York circuit. Um, Matt Bernier's horse, Dazzling Jim, I think has a bright future in the right spots. Uh, I like the horse. I really wanted to pick that horse. I think that horse has got a legitimate shot to finish second by about five lengths because Cupid is so far superior numbers than any other horse in this field, and you add the best Kentucky Derby trainer in the history of our sport and put his favorite jockey on him, I just don't – I mean, he's not going to be 2-1. to one. He's going to be 6-5, to five, yeah. and he's going to win like a 6-5. to five. Yeah, and, you know, Bob, now that we're on the same horse, if, if we're looking to build some vertical tickets here, we're looking for some horses underneath. Obviously, Whitmore is very logical and will benefit from the, uh, the extra distance. Hasn't ran, ran one bad race on, on fast dirt. The only uh, muddy track to face was the Delta Jackpot. He finished fifth. Everything else was first and second. You have Gettysburg coming in for Todd Fletcher. He won this race in 2014 with Danza, 2013 with Over Analyze. This horse was favored in the Sam F. Davis when Stablemate Destin won. That horse goes on to win the Tampa Bay Derby. So we know those two horses are logical. Bobby, did you see anything else that maybe a crazy price that we could use underneath? I like Unbridled, unbridled Outlaw, the six horse, second off the layoff. Um, here's an interesting stat for you. This horse ran in a $78,000 allowance race against Older off of a 140-day layoff and ran second, beat only a length and three quarters. Some would argue, and I heard it argued today, that this horse is dropping in class in a graded one stakes race. But he faced Older and ran well. Dale Romans, I'm a big fan of, especially this time of year. I know Corey Lannery has some faults, but when Dale teams up with Corey, that is the almost the equivalent of, let's say, a, a Todd Pletcher teaming up the, with Javier. Obviously, the numbers don't say that, but you get what I'm saying. This is Dale Romans' number one guy. If he puts Corey on him, he thinks he's got a serious shot to win the race. I think Unbridled Outlaw is a horse that could certainly run second or third and uh, could could – Boost your exotics with Dazzling Jam. I think the seven's got a bright future as well. 
I like the six off that last effort in the last race. And I think the seven horse, albeit green, I don't think we've seen his ceiling in remotely close either. So I would yeah. certainly key the 10 on top and put the six and the seven underneath. Yeah, Bob, and six and seven, definitely other horses I'm looking for. One more horse I, I wanted to mention. And if I recall, Bob, this was your pick in the Rebel. That's number three, Creator. Windstar Farm, Steve Asmussen, Ricardo Santana back aboard. Got himself in a lot, a lot of trouble in that Rebel race. This horse... It's a one-shot closer. We know closers find trouble. I'm just hoping this horse can just close into third, you know, third, uh, close in the second maybe if he can get there. You know, just to finish out some some um, some nice tries, you know, only one time facing winners. He didn't run that bad. He, you know, he closed very, very well. At one point, he was he was out 15 likes in the lead. You know, I want to give him another chance solely underneath, but I think, other than the horses we just mentioned, Bob, we know Cupid is the one to beat and the one that has to be keyed up and down. Yeah, so Andrew and I are getting on the same horse, and believe me, guys, we tried, but he just looks too tough to beat on paper. So Andrew and I both are on Cupid, and that will do it for this week's edition of Tournament Talk on the Tournament Edge. We hope you found you a plethora of winners. And as always, and until next week, good luck. Good luck, guys.